Welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Sound Artists, a co-production of the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. I'm excited because uh, today we're in Burbank at the studios of NFX. We're talking with Daniel Coleman. Thank you, Daniel, and welcome to the uh, to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Daniel got an Emmy Award for his work on Battlestar Galactica, uh, which is when I first became aware of your work. And you've carved out a, 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 a groovy niche for yourself uh, doing science fiction and uh, action adventure work uh, uh, for television. You can currently hear uh, Daniel's work on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Dominion. And, uh, and Agent Carter is Agent coming back. Agent Carter as well. Yeah, yeah, that's coming back. Yeah. So how did you, uh, let's just start easy stuff, softballs, your, your, <laughs> your, your background. Where did, where did you come from and how did you, how did you get involved in sound post-production? Uh, my background is in music, which I sort of think that all sound designers should start in music. Uh, um, I went to the Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, D.C., and then went up to Berklee College of Music in Boston. Oh, cool. Um, I got a degree in music production and engineering from up there. And then when I came out to L.A. after that, I uh, started as music editor. Um, there was a, uh, a former teacher who... Um, uh, not while I was there, but he he had been a Berkeley teacher, um, who is a composer out here, and he's got a, uh, a a shop full of editors. So I worked for him for about a year. Were you studying film music at Berkeley? Uh, I was studying records. Okay. Um, I I I worked on some film scores uh, for for friends, but uh, primarily I was uh, I was doing record music. I was working in a couple of studios in Boston, um, but f- film is very much in my blood. So it was very natural to come out here and edit music for, for TV. Um, and uh, working over there, uh, one night um, a guy came in who uh, was cutting sound effects on a, a show called Pacific Blue. And uh, he uh, he asked me to help him out on the, teach him some Pro Tools stuff. And <laughs> I sat down with the, him. Because you were the Pro Tools guy. Saw what he was doing and went, wow, that looks really cool. <laughs> yeah. And so I started doing effects with him. And uh, pretty soon I stopped doing most music. I, I still did music editing for a while, but uh, I pretty much did the trans- transfer over to sound effects then. Did you ever compose or, or, or did, did you just dive right into music editing? Um, I did a little bit. Not really. I, you know, I played in bands and I, and, and I recorded music. Uh, I don't know. Um, I was much more interested in being behind the scenes. I think maybe right. it's a, it's a, you know, I'm a bass player. Maybe it's a bass player thing that <laughs> let somebody else take the solo, let somebody else compose the song. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stand here and be the backbone. <laughs> Why do you think? Uh, I'm just following up. I think you said it kind of as a joke, but you know about about musicians becoming sound designers, or that it's a good idea for sound designers to have a musical background. Why do you think that is? Because even with all of the the technical stuff that needs to go into what we do, it's all about feel. And I find, you know, I've been doing this for 20-odd years, and people coming in who don't have a musical background don't seem to be able to get that feel where it's not just, you know, see a thing and put a sound where that thing happens. Mm-hmm. It's it's about building textures and making a scene progress through, and it, it's very musical. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have that, at least if you don't have that in your in in your vocabulary, it's very hard to understand how to build a scene that's not just rudimentary stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's been my experience that, you know, a lot of the, the most talented sound designers I've worked with have had perform musical performance or composition backgrounds. And I think, you know, they 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 bring an understanding of it's exactly as you say, like, um, you know, how tonal work can become very emotional. And to me, that's really fertile ground when that line between sound effects and music becomes blurred. Yeah. Yeah, it's always it's it's always fun um, coming up with all of these things that you know you you're sitting there with a whole bunch of of, of, of sounds and the composer has done a whole bunch of things and uh, you've got a director there who can't tell. You know, right. Wait, is that music? Wait, I need that thing. Is that who, who did that? You know, it's 
That's when it's working. Yeah, that's that's what it's working. You know, the, the, there's obvious. You know, it's it's obviously not going to happen when you're working with you know a uh, an orchestra. You know, it's very easy to tell the difference. But you know, when you know, there have been times where I've made you know spaceship out of uh, didgeridoo sounds, and uh, <laughs> uh, then the, uh, the the composer is using an uh, a, a broken AC unit as a uh, mm-hmm. a pad. And it is, you know, it's <laughs> you make both it true, true true stories there. <laughs> Yeah. How did you so um, from that first experience on on Pacific Blue? Then what? How did your career kind of progress? Uh, we were doing Pacific Blue and an HBO show called Arliss, a sports agent show. I remember that show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doing those for a while. Um, on and, this, and you were cutting sound effects. Cutting sound effects on that. I, I actually started cutting dialogue on Pacific Blue, um, and then went over and started doing sound effects. Uh, um, I didn't like doing dialogue very much. It's uh, it's it's too much cleanup work and not not creative <laughs> enough. <laughs> it can be very creative. People are very good at it. I was not yeah. creative at it. Wasn't your thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, we were doing those for a while, and then um, I hmm, we started doing a lot of uh, of these movie of the weeks for the Sci Fi Channel and okay. for USA, uh-huh. and. Uh, I was doing those for many years, and it was career really took off when they suddenly came up with Battlestar and handed it to us. And you know, we we probably got it because we were the cheap guys who did all of their little mm-hmm. movies, and they had no idea that this was going to become something really great. And they were just okay. Here's the next thing we've got for Sci Fi Channel. Yeah. And uh, after that, it would just you know took off. They started doing a lot more really creative things uh, um, in different styles. Warehouse Thirteen, which mm-hmm. was very steampunk, and mm-hmm. it was very interesting to get into all that kind of stuff. And then Arliss, which was much more of the comedy and zany aspects of things. Um, and I I've been doing shows for them for many years, and then through that, all of these other shows have come on board and now working with Marvel it's 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 sort of the same thing where it's it's you know it's action adventure and they don't like the term sci-fi they like Marvel which right. is you know it's, <laughs> they are a brand under they're themselves. a brand and, and it is a different style but it's very much you know it's very much the same idiom of coming up with just things that don't exist and things that can amaze and you know yeah having fun yeah did you, was it clear from the beginning that's, that Battlestar w- was going to be uh, something special? Mm-hmm. No. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, as probably most designers from my generation, you know, we got in because of Ben Burt. We got in because right. of, uh, of watching Star Wars, you know. Um, and so here I was sitting, and, and I got the word that I was going to do Battlestar, and I watched the original Battlestar when I was a kid. I was like, great. Not, I not, get... not known for its fantastic sound design. No, not Battlestar so much. Guy. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I think uh, Lucasfilm sued them at one point. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I got, the, I, I got the call saying that I was going to do Battlestar, and I was like, great. I get to do a space opera. This is fantastic. And then the script came over, and uh, Ron Moore had written a manifesto page that was uh, attached to the script, and it was sort of his um, his idea on how the show should be. And um, the first paragraph said, "We're going to do this as realistic as possible." Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it was something to the extent of, if you flip channels and you came across this, you should think that it was a documentary about life on an aircraft carrier. Interesting. Okay. And one of the first things on it said, "No sound in space." Right. It's like, okay, well, there goes my space opera. There goes all the fun out of it. Yeah, yeah. And they tried going with that approach for a while. They they came up with this idea of having all of these different uh, images on the screen. So in a battle, you would have always um, one image that's inside a ship, so you could always hear... You could always have sound from there, but you would never have sound actually in space. Meaning, like it would be multiplane, like a like a comic book panel. Yeah, like very much. Like pictures okay. would would be coming in, and right. as one person talks, their image comes up from the bottom, and 
Yeah. And they would change size, and they would. That's how all, you would all that you'd stuff. Do. And, and how, how how quickly did that get thrown out the window? They spent uh, <laughs> they spent a while on it. Um, they had they had an editor. They, they had their main editor, and they had another editor who was just working with trying to put that together, and it was a mess. Well, it's it's interesting to even hear you say it because I when you know up at Skywalker when we did. Uh, <laughs> when we did Ang Lee's Hulk movie, that was a huge part of the design. Was it was going to be multi-paneled mm-hmm. and exactly like what you're like things would grow and then diminish. And, and they ended up doing that. I think in a, just a couple of key scenes. But uh, yeah, it just it it doesn't work. It just it's you know it's it's just chaos. It doesn't work. But also when you think about it, that's all of if you're going to do all the action scenes like that. And you're talking, you know, eight panels coming in and out through. That's and out. a lot of stuff you got to shoot and, and, and produce and yeah. add visual effects. Budget yeah. goes absolutely through the roof. Yeah. So while you know that that's a uh, that's an interesting thing from a sound point of view of okay, we can play this as realistic as scientific as possible. That's great, but budget wise and just paying attention to a battle like that. Yeah. And you know, in the in the miniseries, we had. I think four or five eight-minute battle sequences, hmm. and that would be a lot of footage, yeah. a lot of stuff to produce. And if you're doing that the same on every one, it's also really boring. Right. So, so they abandoned that image, and uh, um, I remember having lunch with uh, Michael Reimer, who was the director, and uh, he said, "Okay, so." We're going to have sound in space because it'll be really boring not to. Yeah. Um, but I need you to sell to the audience that there's no sound in space through the sound in space. <laughs> okay. That's like, uh, a, like a Zen koan. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we came up with this idea um, that, okay, you, we, we would actually be – hearing the sound as vibrations through the suit. So if they're if they're in the ship, they're hearing stuff muffled through the cockpit. If they're outside of the ship, if they're touching something, they could hear it. Um, we sort of had to take liberties over time because originally part of the idea was that there would also be no camera angle that wasn't attached to a ship. Oh, interesting. Uh, so so everything, there would be no god shots and stuff. Right, but everything was a literal, supposed to be a literal POV of somebody. Exactly. Right, okay. So as, as time progressed and we went further and further away from that original idea, um, we started playing with that. But um, throughout it, we made all of the sound really um, muted as if it was coming through something else. So it's coming through the ship or coming through mm-hmm. the suit or it's vibration. So I did More a like lot of... feeling it rather than... Yeah, hearing, I did a, yeah. Did, a, did a lot of playing with, uh, um, with piezoelectric... Uh, um, uh, microphones, so you're recording just the vibration instead of how it sounds through the air. Interesting. Uh huh. Um, and I guess the 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 way I started thinking about it was uh, how you how you hear things in a submarine, right? Where it, nothing is really direct sound; it's all vibrations passed off off of other things and bouncing into you, and it's very uh, washed down. It it ended up being an amazing amount of work because. When there's you've no got, library for that stuff, well, right? <laughs> there's that. This is none of this. You know, yeah. That's one thing with sci-fi is you don't, you can't pick out the sci-fi library and start playing with that because yeah. you know it, it. Well, they exist, but they're you know. Sure. If you're inventing something new, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, but it's also the an aspect that I I didn't think about at the time is that when you've got a full spectrum explosion. That's all you can hear when you've got – if your ships are shooting uh, uh, Ben Burt-style lasers, doo, 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 mm-hmm. you can hear four or five of those and mm-hmm. then it mm-hmm. becomes a wash. And um, the visual effects on Battlestar had just ships everywhere and explosions everywhere and yeah. bullets flying all over the When you've got muted sound, your ear can start picking up all this detail. Mm-hmm. So it started becoming, okay – I've actually got to hit everything. As you know, bullets fly by the camera, I've got whooshes going by there. Every time something fires, I've got it. Every ship that's going on screen. Has to have a buy. It's got to have a sound because yeah. if not, you watch it and that one's missing. And right. it's really obvious that that one's missing. Interesting. And, and, and the wash of explosions going on in the background, every single one of those I'm hitting and panning each place. And that's part of it too is that you know, in TV, you don't have you know, 
four months to mix it where you can sit there and have the mixer go, okay, this is going over there and this is going over there and parse through your tracks and figure out what you were trying to do with each mm-hmm. thing. You have to go through and go, okay, as I'm cutting it, I'm placing it. Right. I'm both both level wise and uh, um, and pan wise all through through the uh, the five one spectrum. If not, it just becomes chaos, or you get a mono mix. Right, because they don't have time to sort it out. No. Yeah. So I just wanted just to so we're sitting here in this is your design room, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a, a fully is this a, this is a five point one or a five point one. So. so and you've got a you've got a control service up there. I mean, this is a proper. Yeah, I've got can, I've got a uh, um, a digital design D command up up there, so, which is you know the the same or the the or the step down depending on which stage that uh, that we mix all the shows on. Yeah. So I can just bring my session to them, and they've got it all laid out. I you know, um, I people talk about pre mixing. I set everything the way I want to hear it. Right. Then, of course, you know, the mixer takes that and is balancing it against the dialogue sure. and the music. Um, but I don't want to deliver to the stage, you know, a bunch of tracks at, at Unity and have them, you know, figure out what I had in mind. I want a room where I can play it. This is how it's supposed to sound. Yeah. And a lot of times I'm, you know, bringing directors in here and going, okay, this is, you know, we, I work with them to figure out how everything should be. And then I take it to the stage and it's about balancing that with the other element. So on a, on a show like um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., what's a typical post-production schedule for, for you for sound? We get ideally seven days to turn around a show to do the editorial on it. Um, we're on stage for three days, two days uh, of mixing plus a day of playing back for the executive producers and doing all of their changes. Um, I cut the all the effects myself, so it basically means that I've got three or four days to cut the effects because I'm on stage the rest of the time. Um, and, you know, the while that's happening, my Foley crew is doing their, their right. job. The dialogue editor is doing their job. The uh, ADR is being shot, all of that. And a show is 44 minutes? 44 minutes, correct. You've got four days to prep, and then you go to the mixing stage for three days. So really, I mean, in, in – that's not a lot of time, obviously. So, I mean, the idea must be that you're you basically premix as much as possible. Then, you know, the work on the mixing stage is really about balancing that against dialogue and music, right? And getting all of the ADR in and stuff. And yeah, on, on Agents of Shield, we've got a an eighty piece orchestra for a lot of it. So that's a lot of a lot of dynamics to get into a TV spectrum, which you know you can't go you can't go full wide like you can in a feature. Uh, on TV, you've got very, you've got very severe limits as to how far you can go outside. You have to keep dialogue in a very, ter- uh, very tight range, and then you have to balance everything around that. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of math that happens, right? I mean, is that is that basically because there's a lot just, of give you, and take? You just don't like there's just it's just limited dynamic range yes. for television. Yeah, you have a very you have strict enforced dynamic range um, on everything. Uh, and on, on some networks, it's act by act. On some networks, it's all the way through. But there are strict limitations. You can't just go full wide and make everything sound as wonderful as, as possible um, because on TV, you'll be you know grabbing your remote constantly and bringing it up and down and up oh, and Oh, so down. that's really interesting. So you'll have – you basically have to hit an average dynamic value over a period of time. Yes. So – but it's not really in your best interest to have a huge – gargantuan scene and then a bunch of little quiet scenes because that's actually not a great experience for the end user at home because they're going to be turning up and turning down, right? Right, right. Um, on the other hand, if you've got an act that is all action, right, then you you end up having to lower everything because you got nowhere to go. You can't go higher than that. Yeah. So it be, it it becomes it becomes very difficult to balance all that out. And of course, you know, music is trying to go huge on, 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 on these scenes and I'm trying to go huge on these scenes and you know we have to do a lot of communication to go okay I'm going to take this part you take that part and figure all that stuff out. So you're talking with the composer? Oh yeah. Because they don't have any time either right? No. No they you know we usually spot um, an unlocked picture a couple of weeks beforehand to start thinking about stuff and that's when the composer um, in this case on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. it's Bear McCreary who I've done probably 15 shows with um, and he starts writing to that, 
at while the video editors are still cutting. Sure. And so then once that gets, you know, he takes that, takes that to the uh, scoring stage, records that, and then the music editor has to fit it all back into right. the new cut of the show. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of him calling me and saying, I need this part. I need you to clear out of this part. And Get I'm out of saying, this frequency range. I, exactly. So I can, you know, I'm going to go yeah. high here. You go low here. Yeah, yeah. Because if we tried to both hit everything, Train it just wouldn't work. Yeah. And it's so interesting because, you know, in, in the feature world, we pay a lot of lip service to doing that level of coordination and having this kind of, <laughs> and it so rarely actually happens, you know. But you guys have to because you have these very strict technical limitations on how loud I can get over a period of time. Yeah, and you know, I'm 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 fortunate on some of the shows to work with composers who are really open to that. Um on other shows, I've definitely worked with ones who, you know, uh I, I I'd say the, you know, the the typical scene that I hate is the big build up to an explosion or a car wreck or something like that where um and if the composer is building up and then goes wild on the explosion, I have no dynamic range to put anything in. Right. Um, if they build up really big and then jump down to a pad and let me do the explosion, that's great. Sure. But that doesn't happen unless we talk. Right. Or unless they're really used to right. dealing with that kind of stuff. Because this is, um, yeah, this is a, a, a funny phenomenon we always used to refer to as the 100% rule. Like everybody yes, thinks it's course. 100% their job to make sure that the thing works. Yeah, it, it, and, and, and exists on so many different levels. It, it happens with uh, Loop Group, too, where right. they want to fill in every detail. It's like, no, 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 really? I, I just need you here and here. <laughs> Those are the two places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, Foley will try to cover everything. So, you know, the, early on when I'm working with new Foley art, artists, it's like, no, these are the things I'm going to cover. Don't try to do, uh, you know, don't try, try to do typing because right. you're just going to make a mess of it. I'm going to hit every single key. Per, that I'll, cover that. I'll, cu- I'll, I'll cut that, that in effect. You know, yeah. and, and even to the, the, the point of, you know, the most, the, the, the thing everybody knows about Foley is, you know, the coconut footsteps for horses. I don't do any of that. You know, I want tack. I want, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I want motion for the horses. Yeah. I'll cut the footsteps because I'll get everyone in sync yeah. the way I want it to. You do the cloth for the rider. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the leather. That I can't do with, you know, I can't do with pre-recorded stuff. You you perform that. Talk to me about your sound effects library because the, the, as you're talking about the schedule and basically saying, you know, like you've got three days, four days to cut and three days to mix, the thing, <laughs> you know, from my perspective, the thing that immediately went out the window is field recording. You know, there's no time to, you know, to go out and gather new sounds to put something in. So you must, I mean, obviously your your library is, is the, you know, the heart and soul and DNA of what you're doing here, right? Well, there's definitely that. I mean, uh, um, could not exist without a lot of libraries, and you know, there's not there's not one that covers everything. You you, you go out and get. Well, I, presume, I presume you built up your own over the over oh, years yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm constantly recording things. Yeah, I'm constantly stealing things from uh, from production from uh, sure. You know, one show. You know, there was this great sound in this show. I'll use it in this show. Do you go um, back through dailies and just and grab stuff that you can then? No, that's. Uh, it's, I, I I do. It's it, it well. If there's time, if I'm told that there's something there, you know, a lot of times right. the, the an assistant will be building the dialogue and will say, hey, there's this cool sound. Mm. And, yeah, I'll grab that. Or if, you know, um, like if there's a particular car in a uh, in an episode, I'll say, you know, go and grab me every take that they did with this car. And I'll build a car library right. out of every bit that they did between dialogue. Yeah, and even if that's just one, you know, long in and stop or anything, you know, taking the little slivers of sound to build, you know, a lot of these cars, you know, I I, I would love to to have, but sure. I can't go out and record everything. That being said, as much as possible, I do record. So mm-hmm. like, you know, you can't build, you can't build science fiction off of a library. We said that. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I'm constantly finding things that I can use in there, and if I have time, I'm recording. So like. Um, I, I did a show called Trauma, 
And I knew that was coming up. I knew it was going to be, you know, paramedics in San Francisco. So I took a weekend and I went up to San Francisco and I arranged ride alongs with the paramedics. Did and you I really? a whole bunch of stuff um, because there was no, and, th- and then I rented a. Uh, and this a, is the good thing about going to San Francisco about that stuff is like, it's cool to them. As opposed, oh, to, yeah. as opposed to being in L.A. Oh, where yeah. people were like, ugh, oh, another, another movie guy, right? <laughs> no, they, they, they were great. And they, they, they were absolutely wonderful. And I learned a whole lot about, about being a paramedic from them, which was wonderful. But I also got all these sounds. And then I came back, and I still had uh, a few days before we started the pilot. So I went, and uh, um, there's a uh, – one of the cool things about being in Burbank is you could f- rent – Anything. <laughs> so there's this lot that has every vehicle you can imagine, sure. you know, through uh, uh, up until the last few years. Um, so I rented a, a, an F-350 ambulance and took it out to the middle of the desert and, uh, and had a good uh, time and, and, and recorded it and recorded every little door on it and, re- you know. Recorded it driving in every condition yeah. we could. could, could so that became the library. That so that, my library. So that so that's the other answer to the question, which is you do have time before the first episode, but once you can, it's kind of like once that once that train leaves the station, you're barreling, right? Yeah, uh, that th- then you know s- sometimes I'm able to um, to talk before we start uh, into a series and get an idea of certain things. So like um, you know, I did a show years ago g- called Gossip Girl, which was New York City. And they really wanted the, uh, the the city to be alive, to be a character in it. Um, so I talked to uh, the executive producer and said, okay, give me every location that you think you're going to go to. Um, and, you know, I got probably a dozen different things. I went out to New York and I spent a weekend walking through the city. And so, you know, it's, it, it wasn't – it's not a big design show. It was just, you know, mm-hmm. kids in, in – in, Kind in, of a walkie-talkie. In, in prep uh-huh. school. But – when they're sitting on the steps of the Met, I've got steps of the Met traffic. I've got Fifth Avenue traffic. I've got right. the birds from the park right behind the Met. It's important stuff. So, so yeah. it, it, it is the character of the show. So that's what you want. So as much as I can do that, I do it. But, yeah, if something comes onto my desk and, you know, I'm, I'm on another show right beforehand, I can't go out and record it. Oh, I love that stuff. I, you know, we've, we've gone out and recorded you know, tuner cars and, you know, every mm-hmm. vehicle that we can get our hands on, we'll go out and record and, you know, and what planes, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming also you're seeing a lot of visual effects on the mixing stage for the first time, right? I am. So you carry your library with you and you're cutting oh, on yeah. the fly and. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of my prep work on science fiction stuff is um, I'm, uh, you know, I've got a description on the screen of what's going on. So they'll send you a cut with a blank shot, but it's just a text description of what, you know. Yeah, it's either blank or it's an actor in front of a green screen uh, uh, mimicking something. And I have to go with, you know, what the producers have told me or what I can get from their acting. Or, you know, a lot of it is the the tonal palette that Mm -hmm. we've built for the show. Mm -hmm. And go, okay, these are the elements that I think I'll need for this. Right. And hopefully I've got everything I need or, you know, add one thing because, yeah, the second I hit the, the, uh, the dub stage, things are pouring in shot after shot. And, you know, uh, um, I did the show called Warehouse 13 where some episodes we had 600 visual effects shots in 44 minutes. And the style of that show was everything had a sound. Interesting. And it might not be, you know, it might not be a big design thing. It might be, you know... Um, uh, one little, you know, light that shimmers off of something, but it has to match exactly with the visuals. It has to have its own character. Yeah. It has to tell the story, obviously. Yeah. That's yeah. the most important thing. It has to get the emotion across of, of what's going on. But, yeah, all those things are just pouring in at the last minute. It's just amazing that, that you know, what, what you're able to do, especially given the time constraints. You know, I, I remember really clearly, you know, I, I watched – you know, the original Battlestar Galactica when I was a kid. And so, I, I, you know, I was a fan of that. And so I was really curious uh, and, and very eager when, when the show started. It was 2004, I think it was? 2003, we did the miniseries. And in 2004, we started the series. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I was already up at Skywalker at that point running the, the studio. And I have just a very vivid recollection of watching the miniseries and just having this sort of sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach is because it sounded so good. And I knew <laughs> that you guys weren't spending anywhere near the kind of budgets that we were having at Skywalker. And I just anticipated, you know, this conversation that would happen, well, you know, with, with producers about, like, 
well, hell, Battlestar sounded fantastic. And, you know, so you guys actually hired uh, a uh, the post-production supervisor off the show, yeah. Trish Bruner, yeah. to come up there and, uh, yeah. and, 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 and explain how the hell we did it. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure when George was was thinking about doing his uh, television s- series, he did exactly that. But I, I just, you know, the, the work on Battlestar was so was so fresh, and it it didn't sound like anything on television at the time. Um, so you know, kudos and congratulations to you. Thank for you. That. And, and really, it hasn't sounded like anything since until Gravity came out. And right. It was great going into the theater and watching that and going. Yes, they embraced our ideas. Yeah. Wonderful. It's really true. It's really true. <laughs> and they did, you know, they 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 obviously, you know, they took they took it to another level with all of the yeah. uh, the stuff flying by, which was great. Um uh, But it was still that same basic idea of like we're experiencing sound through vibration, not yeah. through, yeah. 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 It, it was something. Did you get a lot of pushback? What I mean, what was the reaction to Battlestar? I remember you telling me a story about somebody who was doing the <laughs> Emonies. <laughs> yeah, the mixer uh who did the Emonies on the first season, he had mixed a lot of the um, you know, Star Trek ne- Next Generation and the, those things. And uh, I got this call up at about like 7 p.m. on a Friday night um, saying, uh, there's something wrong, you're missing an effect stem. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> they said, well, all the lasers, there's no sound for them. Like, so I, I, I got really scared and I went in and I pull, pulled up the mix and I'm listening to it and I'm like, no, it, it's all there, it sounds fine. Like no, there's. I, I, look, I've been doing this a long time. I can tell you, there are no sounds for the lasers. It, is, it doesn't go pew pew pew. <laughs> that's what he. That's what he. You know, in his mind, that was the only thing. And the the funny thing about it is, you know, that's not a sound of a laser. That's a sound of a, a metal line being hit by a hammer that, that you know, Ben Burt, you know, came up with. Yeah, that's and, not and, and everybody's yeah. been copying him ever since. And there was this sort of idea that that's what it has to be, be which you know. He came up with an amazing sound, and, right. and, and and it works so well, and it tells the story so well. But it's just a sound, and uh, you know, it, working with the theory of of of, um, of this version of Battlestar, we weren't those weren't lasers; those are those are physical bullets right. that are flying through. So they shouldn't have that sound anyway. And then you go with the concept of the through vibration yeah. uh, muted sound, and. There's no way that that would have been the right sound, but right. that's uh, an, another another funny story about that is uh, and sort of the um, the 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 point where I knew that what I had done actually worked was um, I told you that there was there was that manifesto from Ron Moore about you know no sound in space and apparently that leaked on the internet. Um, so people were writing about how there was no sound in space, and people were saying that that was, you know, a budgetary thing to uh, uh, <laughs> save on sound effects, which, you know, I didn't know I got paid Could by the sound effect, right, but, right, you know, right, that's yeah. great. Um, but I started reading in these blogs about that people had clearly watched the show, yeah. and they were talking about the no sound. So obviously I, it, it, it worked yeah. because for some people it – you were communicating. I was a communicating that there was no sound. So once, if if they expected no sound, they I don't know if they just thought it was music or if they didn't think about it. But those were jam packed full of sound. <laughs> well, it's not. But it wasn't what they were. It, it wasn't using the vocabulary that they were used right. to. So they were hearing it in a different way. And it yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, what are the biggest challenges for you in your job? It's just is it resource management? Is it is it trying to because obviously you know nobody wants to hear. From back from you. Well, I didn't have time to cover that. You know. Oh no, there's there's no such thing as that. Um, yeah, it's uh, time is is you know there's definitely resource management. There's definitely you know uh, being a supervisor, you're scheduling a whole team of people. I've got my foley people, I've got my dialogue people, my ADR. We, uh, most of my shows film in other um, in other countries, so we've mm-hmm. got ISDN that we're recording actors all over the world mm-hmm. for. Um, so there's all of that 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 we've got to deal with, um, but. It's 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 a lot of uh, being creative while being very um, cognizant of the mixers and what they need to do. Mm-hmm. So when I'm you know if if I'm building say a car chase, um, the 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 engines are all together on a f- 
you know, in, in a grouping of tracks. Mm -hmm. They're all color coded. So, you know, they can look at it and go, the blue is that car, the red is that car, the brown is the tire screeches. Um, they never have to go through and listen to every single sound like mm -hmm. like you might want to do on a feature, so right. that you've got every little detail. No, you you know it's it's you know raise the engine at this point. Okay, there there I can visually see that's the engine. I've you know, labeled yeah. the tracks. Um, the layout is crucial. Where you know the mixer shouldn't have to look at the Pro Tools to go okay. I, I need this sound. They can go, you know, a door comes up. The doors are, I always put on the first couple of tracks. So you go to one through five and, you know, And it's that way doors. consistently from episode to episode. So you guys get episode into a groove. They know what, they basically know where stuff is going to be. Yeah. If, yeah. There, if there's, you know, if there's an element that is consistent through the show, I might make a whole set of stem tracks just for that. So like on Dominion, it's about angels. We've got these winged creatures. I've got a wing set of them. So, you know, there's, there's, Think fifteen tracks. These are the wings. You you never have to think it. You can make a group fader once you've you know balanced those out. You know, raise or lower the wings. You've got it. I'm curious. How are you doing wings on the show? <laughs> what's the secret? What's the secret sauce? Uh, wings are wings are hard. <laughs> um, it's 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 a combination. There's you know, <sighs> there's pitch down feathers. There's cloth. There's just you know. It, 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 it sort of depends on the speed of the, the wings uh -huh. as to what I'm using for it. Um, there's, is there actually a wing sound or is it just mostly air moving? No, there's 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 wing sounds. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when, when you're up close to a feather. Yeah. It actually know. makes some sound. Oh, yeah. 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 I, but uh, those those are really difficult to get right, <laughs> especially like they're giant wings. You know, you right. having a bird flap, that's, that, that's pretty easy. But, yeah. uh, you know, giant wings, yeah, that's, that's tough. Well, I, I don't. I can't think of a better way to end than on giant wings. I think that's just perfect. Daniel, thank you so much for letting us into the studio. We're here uh, in beautiful downtown Burbank <laughs> at at Anifex and listening to how this man pulls off magic every week on these shows with just uh, just uh, an amazing amount of creativity and not a lot of time. So thank you for taking some time and talking to us today. This has been um, this has been uh, the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Thank you, Daniel, once again. Thank you very much.